This is Jonathan Yates with HBCU Game Day Network. Today we're in the heart of the land of pleasant living, the Chesapeake Bay watershed, with Dr. Heidi Anderson, the president of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Dr. Anderson, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Anderson, you have very prominently on your page the values of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. You have institutional values, interpersonal values, and the eye care values. Really? How do you feel they comport with the role of an HBCU? Let me talk to you about those a little bit, Jonathan. First of all, any institution has a mission statement and it has a vision mm -hmm. statement and values. And pretty much your values really are rooted into your mission statement. So let me give you an example. The great. values here at, UN at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore are integrity, uh, commitment, uh, accountability, respect, and also excellence. If you think about that in terms of our being an 18, 1890 land-grant institution, what that really means is that we have been committed to make sure we fulfill our mission from the time when we, from 133 years ago when we were formed. So it basically says we're committed to access and making sure that we have any learner who wants to come through at, from a standpoint from economically disadvantaged to any diversity background, any race, any cultural background, that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn, get, make sure students are learning. We also are committed to our community as an 1890 land grant. And that means basically that we're here to serve our community, but also to make sure we look at the problems that are in our community and the surrounding region and help resolve those. So that comes from a standpoint of focusing on being the land grant, but also making sure we follow through. And then the biggest thing from a standpoint of values, what we're trying to say is we want to give high quality education to anyone who comes through. And so that's the value of excellence. Uh, I think you'll find that this, you, these values are kind of unique to most HBCUs, but I really like the fact that we have roped them into a value where our, fa of our family, our community here, knows that they're posted there on the website, they're all across the campus and see them. And we have to live and espouse by them as well. Now, when I've interviewed others on this show from HBCU backgrounds, they use the word family a lot. How, uh -huh. do you th how Why is that so important for an HBCU and its mission? I think it's important because our our students come to us from all areas and a lot of us, we get a lot of students who are first generation. I'm a first generation student myself. And typically when you're coming, especially from an African American family, you, you're used to that group of individuals who take care of you, who nurture you, who really follow up and pay attention to what it is you're doing. And at an HBCU, and it's one of the reasons I'm really proud to be a president here, is because that's what we try to do. And I really try to make it a point to get to know my students and pay attention to what's happening to them, but not just me. All of our, I would say, our faculty, our staff, everyone is concerned about the students, and then the students care about each other. That's like a family. I go over and have you know meals with my students. I'll see them in the evenings. Last night was their tutoring session to get them ready for final exams next week. And I went through to say, you know, how are you doing? I want some A's here. It's okay <laughs> if they get B's. You know, B's are great. But that's what we mean by family. Sure. And so, and and when they see me on the campus, I want them to be able to walk up and talk with me, and not just to me, but to any faculty member, any of our staff. So that's what we mean by family. Now, I had Dr. Christine Kelly on my show. She now works at Dartmouth College, but she has an HBCU background, both as a student athlete and as an administrator. Mm -hmm. And she told me that she knew of a lot of, of people now with terminal degrees, doctors, lawyers, educators, that if it had not been for the second chance that HBCUs had given them, they would have never graduated from college, least of all going on to earn a terminal degree. Have you yes. come across them at that too? Of course. I think you'll find that with the, you have over, a little over 100 HBCUs in the country. Mm -hmm. And obviously because of our mission and how we were formed, HBCUs have prepared more African American professionals than any other universe, any other institution in the country. So you're looking at over 25% of your professional African American out there probably have some kind of HBCU background. You have over 70% um, of your uh, dentists, our African-American dentists come from HBCUs. Over 30% of your teach African-American teachers have come from HBCU background. So I find that you would find that that is really typical across the country. Now, obviously we're becoming more diverse and um, Obviously, that you know, that's we want to make sure we stay continue to maintain that 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 mission and that foundation of who we are. 
but it's not unusual for that to have expanded across the country. Now, Dr. Kelly, she also said that she is pushing hard so there's going to be a lot more sports interaction between HBCUs mm -hmm. and Ivy Leagues. Because she says that each one has a unique mission, but she said that what she noticed at Dartmouth that is missing is, again, this word, the sense of family oh. that you get at an HBCU yes. institution. She said you go to game day at Dartmouth, you know, there's not a whole lot of hugging and how are you doing and, you know, what have you been up to? But she uh -huh. said, you know, you go to game day at an HBCU thing. She said it's like, you know, being back at church again or something. It's such mm -hmm. a deep moving experience. Is it the same way here at the I University think it of Maryland? Is. I think Shore? it is. And I think we're now you have to understand that, you know, I've only been here for a year. And so I haven't had that many game days just yet. But the ones that we have, you know, you can tell our alumni come back. They love to be here. Our students meet them. I, I, I visit with them. And it is like coming back to visit, you know, with your family and really catching up. Our Alumni will be here, especially on homecoming, and they'll talk to faculty that that, that were uh, there when they were students. They want to get back with you know and check out this particular office, and so it's the same kind of atmosphere. So let's get yeah. back to values again, but this time in the context of student athletes. When I had Keith Davidson, your athletic director, on the show, he made the point that he will not allow any athlete from high school to be recruited unless they have a commitment. To graduating from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. How do, does that come apart with the values you espouse? It comes, it, it connects like this and aligns in this way. Not just student athletes, mm -hmm. but any student that we bring in. My focus and our and my vision and goal is to try to make sure we graduate any student, make sure they walk across that, that stage. And so it doesn't matter whether they're a student athlete or not. So when he's saying he's only going to recruit people who can actually come across, that means we're going to put the resources behind to make sure that happens. So you pick up, you get a student, you recruit them, whether they're an athlete or not. We want to make sure we've got the right student support services, the tutoring, the helping that they need, uh, whatever the nurturing that they're going to need to get them across and get them over the finish line. And so it applies to all students. To me, it doesn't matter whether the student is coming with us to play basketball, to bowl on our lanes, or to be out there, you know, on the golf uh, um, course. They are a student first, and that's going to be what we're going to primarily focus on. Now, what led you to go to Purdue University? <laughs> Well, I grew up in Indiana. Indiana's home for me, Gary, Indiana. And uh, I actually wanted to go to an HBCU, but I also grew up with a, with a mother who raised us by herself. So there, was, there wasn't a lot of money. Sure. And so that means you got to look at a state institution. There are no HBCUs in the state of Indiana. And so, uh, lo and behold, I also wanted to major in pharmacy. And when, if you want to major in pharmacy and you live in Indiana, the best place to go is Purdue. I didn't know that at the time, but it was like I got accepted and um, it was right there, allowed me to be able to go back and forth to home when I needed to. And that was the other, other criteria I looked at. How can I, where can I go to school that I could also get back to home, you know, in two or three hours if I needed to. What led you to pick pharmacy as a major? That's a unique crack career route for one who became educator administrator? Well, obviously, I didn't think at the time I'd become a president, <laughs> <laughs> but I picked pharmacy because in my family and uh, in the community that I was in, a lot of people had health problems. So my family uh, had a lot of diabetes, okay. and I thought, I want to pick something where I can help them, but I don't want to spend all those years to go and be a doctor. And I knew I didn't want to be a nurse who wants to deal with blood and guts <laughs> all the time, you know? So pharmacy was that in-between for me. And it ended up being the right in between because the pharmacists, and I was a retail pharmacist, I practiced for a number of years, and the retail pharmacists, you're right there in the community. And it's all about the community and people coming in and getting to know you. Um, we're near Christmas time. In pharmacies, when you're working in a small community, they bring you fruitcakes like crazy. I hate fruitcakes to these I was going to say, I'm sure you don't miss that about being all. a pharmacist. Not at all. If we can edit that out, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, what led but, you to go into teaching? I, it's it, the same kind of thing that led me into pharmacy. Once I became a pharmacy student and started really learning to practice pharmacy, well, I didn't even learn it. I was there as a student and um, go home and people would say, you know, what is this? Can you, can you tell me what this scratch is or what I'm supposed to do about this? And I'd say, I'm only a first year pharmacy student. I don't know that stuff. Second year comes around. Can you help me with this? I'm only a second year pharmacy student. I don't know that stuff. So by the time I got to be a fourth year pharmacy student, I was like, I should have been working with patients. So I started thinking, they're not teaching well. And so some of the professors, I'm thinking, you could teach this stuff better than this, make it apply, have students learn it and understand it from the first year. So I got interested in teaching. And I said, if you're gonna make changes in the curriculum, you have to then become a teacher. 
got in there, started changing it as I became a professor, and then it wasn't enough change for me. And that's when I started thinking about the leadership tr track. How has being a teacher helped you being a president? I think in a number of ways. One, I am very student focused, and so being a teacher helps me remember the students have come here to learn, and that's my responsibility to make sure they do that. Being a teacher helps me make sure that I look at goals. There should be an outcome, and so, uh, and not just from the classroom, but in everything that we do. So it really helps guide me and helps me, st helps, helps me stay mission focused. Now, what led you from becoming a teacher into administration? It would seem to be just the opposite reason you became a teacher, because it, it's taking you away from the students it, now. It is, but not really, because I became an administrator after teaching for a number of years, and I said, well, this whole thing about trying to get them to teach in a way where students can understand it from the first year and can apply it from the first year wasn't working. And I started realizing if you want to make major change, and I'm about making change, you need to do it from being a leader and be the leader who can actually model and also encourage and, um, ex and, and have that vision to help people understand this is how we can do it. So for example, we have aviation sciences here at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I'm very proud of all our programs, but would you want a pilot who had not gotten, gotten a chance to really practice flying the plane until their senior year? Not, no, no, I don't think, think so. Not in a Boeing 730 Max. That's exactly, yes. Max, that's for sure. No. So that's why I started looking at leadership in pharmacy. I didn't want my pharmacy students coming out and just learning how to take care of patients by the time they get to their last year. They need to learn how to do it right from the beginning. Now, how has your leadership style evolved as you've moved up the career ladder in higher ed administration? That's a good question, Jonathan. Um, one th way it's my leadership style has evolved is I've become more patient. <laughs> And I become, and by patient, that means that I, I listen in a different way. So I listen not just to what the words people are saying, but also the context and also the other things that shape their experience. But I also, it has evolved from the sense of me being more reflective and um, always still been goal-directed and outcomes-driven. But I think the two ways it's evolved is that patience and that reflectivity. And then the the other thing I would say is my level of respect, which is one of my basic values, and I, respect, I have a level of respect for everyone. And um, those are kind of the tenets of my leadership style. And so what, you've worked at a variety of institutions. How has that molded your leadership style? I, one, I love traveling, and I love <laughs> meeting different people. People are the same no matter where you're at, and you're correct, I have worked at a variety. What that has helped me do is bring to this, in this leadership position, um, I would say, practices and principles and, and things that, are, that I've seen that are best practices in other places and pull them all into one. And so for example, when I, I worked in Indiana, I, I grew up in Indiana, and then I left there, went to Tennessee, and then Alabama and Kentucky. I was in Philadelphia for a short while, and then now, and in Texas for a short while. And all of that has allowed me to say, you know, how do I shape learning from the standpoint of people in general? and how do I look at people as a whole and what mm -hmm. their needs are. And I think that's how it's, it's, it's helped. Yeah. So how have you seen yeah. students change over the course of your career, starting from when you were an undergraduate at Purdue? Well, obviously we want the, the, the obvious things with the hair and you know the technology is, is easy, but how students have changed, I think, is that they are not as confident. I think students when, when that I've seen years ago are probably more uh, likely to be out there in civic engagement and we're and really f looking at the social justice issues mm -hmm. and I, I love the fact that I think we're going back to that but for a time period there I think what I saw with students is really relying on mom or dad or some uh, other adult to really tell them what they're supposed to be doing and not having that independence so I'm beginning to see a resurgence of that, and that's what I hope that we can begin to instill into our students here at UMES. Now, when I interviewed Dr. Brenda Kelly, the president of Lincoln University, she talked about how she would get emails yes. from her students at two or three in the morning, and you mentioned sort of the, the greater technology now. What do you, how do you see how technology has sort of changed the game for you as a college president? Technology is interesting because, and that's part of where I was leading to with the students, technology has made our students be more introspective and uh, not facing each other. So as a president, as a leader, I realize um, my students are out there in technology and I need to be out there. And so I try to be out there tweeting as often as I can. I try to really 
focus on them. And um, if, they, if I'm at an event and the students are there, they know I'm taking pictures and they know that I may end up tweeting something out. And I think they're, they might be, may be having a contest now to say, okay, let me take a picture of the president and see if she's gonna get it out there. But that's how I've used technology. And um, from a leadership standpoint, we also use it to get information out just about the institution. And so in that sense, it's very valuable because one of the things that we really have to work on doing as, as presidents is uh, fundraising. Where fiscal, you know, the fiscal climate has really changed for, for higher education. So we're out there fundraising quite a bit. And I really rely on the technology to help us do that in a major way. There's an expression, Midwest nice. You don't hear that about students from the East Coast. This is University of Maryland Eastern Shore. You're a state university here. Have you noticed a difference between East Coast students than those from Purdue, those from Texas, those from Kentucky? It, Jonathan, that's a good question. To me, students yeah, we, are, we come to play here at students, HBCU Game Day. Students are students to me any place. It's like um, I really haven't noticed the difference in the, in the, in the type. I, I think that I've noticed more of large campuses versus small campuses. What are the differences there? And there I see, uh, again, at larger campuses like at a Purdue or at, at Auburn where I've been at, I've seen students are more, uh, they don't know each other as well and they're not even connected to each other. Whereas at small campuses, the students actually get it, even, they may not know everyone by name, but they know who they are and, and it becomes a lot more friendlier uh, climate. Yeah. And so the students at the larger campuses, you know, they'll, they'll rely on the Greek life system mm -hmm. to, to stab with your staff. So what's the Greek life system here at a smaller campus? It's the same. I think students rely on our Greek life system, but in addition to that at a smaller campus, where students are not Greek, they recognize you have other social activities and other organizations. So we have non-Greek school to student organizations, a number of them here, and then our students will form their own. Um, and, and, and I think that's what uh, is another big difference between a larger campus, because larger campuses, students don't tend to know what those other pockets are quite a bit. So I grew up on the East Coast, living in the D.C. area, and then in L.A., in the L.A. area. But I came to grow to love living in the Midwest. I lived in Chicago and West Lafayette, mm -hmm. speaking Purdue. What do you miss most about the Midwest? <sighs> Interesting. I do not miss the snow. No, I was there six yes. months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and see, I grew up in Gary, and Gary's only 20 miles from Chicago, so it's snow and windy, and I don't miss that. I think the only the thing I miss would probably miss about the Midwest is getting a really good pizza. <laughs> And uh, they would say, think that's strange on the East Coast, but you get good pizza in Chicago. No, that, that's not strange. It's, and the cinnamon it, buns in West Lafayette at the 66 you, Diner, you don't get on the East Coast That's either. correct. You can't. <laughs> but here we are. We're on the but, eastern shore of Maryland, which mm -hmm. is called the heart of the land of pleasant living. Yes. What do you, have you come to grow to love about this part of Maryland, the eastern shore, that you did not expect to when you first took the job? I'll tell you. What I didn't, when I took the job and I started looking at the map as to where it was, what I began, began to love about this is the climate. People think that, oh, you're in Maryland, so it's a lot of snow and it's very cold. It's very little snow. We are surrounded by the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, and that just does wonders for making our weather be very perfect. So what steps have you taken to raise the profile of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore so people do not sort of think that, you know, this is Chicago or Gary where the snow starts at October? <laughs> it's it's going to be 70 degrees on Tuesday and it's December. Well, one, a couple of steps we've taken to raise the profile. One, people do not recognize and realize that our university, we have the only aviation sciences program in the state of Maryland. And it's a shortage of pilots. So we're trying to get the word out about that. People do not realize that we have a golf PGA Manage, certified PGA management program here. So you can graduate as a commercial pilot from the That's university? That's correct. Oh. You can graduate as a commercial pilot and you can probably be in the aviation sciences program and learning how to do, improve your golf game at the same time. Because well, from living in West Lafayette, I remember that Purdue had its own airport. That's correct. And Purdue had its own golf course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you left that? <laughs> I'm here in Maryland <laughs> and I'm here in Princess Anne where the weather is great. <laughs> and so when you graduate with a golf degree, what can you do with that? Very interesting. Our students, first of all, who graduated with golf degrees, they're all over in, in top premier golf courses, but they're managers, and so they can be focused on, on turf development and how to make sure the golf courses are maintained properly, but they also connected with a hotel tourism management degree. Sure. So then they can be uh, supervisors and in, in, the, in the hotel restaurant management business as well. And I shouldn't make people think out there that we only have those two fun degrees because we also have health professional uh, programs. We have our agricultural uh, fo focused areas, a number of STEM and a number of liberal arts. So we're what I think is a well-rounded university. 
Now, I had yeah. Bob Culver, who's the county executive from Wicomico County, mm -hmm. on my show, too, and he is trying to turn this area into a sports mecca. What are you doing here at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore to work with the local community? We try to do a lot with the local community, and so that's part of, uh, Jonathan, where we go back to our roots again, our 1890s. And my strong belief as a president is that the university is only as strong as the community, the community mm -hmm. is only as strong as the university. So we're doing a number of things. So for example, when I mention our health profession programs, in the, here in the rural area, we, there's an opioid crisis, and it's an opioid crisis around the world. Yes around the country. And um, our School of Pharmacy and Health Profession Sciences is working, has professors and researchers working on how do we work on solving that problem, but more importantly, how do we go out into the community. Our, stu our pharmacy students will go out and help with, um, there's a, a, a day where in the, in the region here where they do dental work and help bring a lot of lower income pe people who don't have access to dental care, they bring them in to get dental treatment. So we help with that. Then you have our agriculture students out in the community helping grow gardens and trying to show our community how to deal with food, uh, who are food insecure, how to you know, create food that, that's sustainable. And uh, so a number of things we do to really focus and help, help the community. And that's always been the heritage of the University of It Maryland. really, it has been, and it will always stay the heritage. Well, so that's, yes. that's the, the past for the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Mm -hmm. What do you see ahead for the future? What are your goals? Let's, let's end up the interview with that question. The campus knows, uh, I've been here one year, and I, when I got here last year and gave my State of the Union address in January, I told them, I said, we are a top 20 HBCU and has been in that path for some years. It's no reason why we can't become a top 10 HBCU. So that's my goal for this, for this campus, is to move us up. And, and, and it's not just about the rankings. It's about we are a premier institution, and people should recognize that. And on the, in Maryland, on this side of the bay, we're the only doctoral research institution out there. So my vision and my goal is to see us continue to rise, but also to see us become that partner with the community where we're recognized as that's where you go to to help us with what, what our needs are. You know, Dr. Anderson, I'm an honest person, but I lied on that last question. It's not oh, the yes, last yes. one. Here's the last one. I always get to interviews early so I okay. can walk around the campus and talk to yes. the students here. And someone were talking about a recent event they had, and they said that you were there having a great time with everyone, and they love to have you change. That was just a welcome change here at the University of Maryland Eastern sure. Will that ever change? Never. Not at all. Which event was that? <laughs> <laughs> now, I won't be going to their, their rap events. They're, they're getting these rappers here, and, and so I'm thinking, they're usually too late in the evenings <laughs> for me. But uh, no, that'll never change. That's who I am, and that's part of why I wanted to come to a small institution. Well, Dr. Anderson, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's Jonathan Yates okay. with HBCU Game Day Network. Thank you for joining us. Okay.